Hello, I'm Jeremy Vine, and this is Panorama. It's 10 years since 29 people and two unborn babies were killed by terrorists in Oma. The men who exploded a 500-pound bomb that day have never been caught. And tonight, Panorama suggests why. There was GCHQ monitoring of at least one telephone on the day of the Oma bombing. That is my understanding, yes. Not only listening, but recording the coded words of the bombers as the bomb car was parked. Bricks are in the war. But this and other vital intelligence was never passed to the detectives trying to put them in jail. Millions of pounds have been spent and untold promises made about how those responsible for the biggest single atrocity of the Irish Troubles would be brought to justice. And yet still no one is in prison. The real scandal is that there was a huge amount of intelligence on the killers, but it was never passed to the police responsible for catching them. So this is the inside story of what even those detectives were never told. Till we gather once again in that bright city. These are some of the families of those killed in Oma ten years ago. And we're Irish republicanism may have moved on, but the Oma families have refused to allow its violent legacy to be airbrushed away. They had to fight to get the words murdered by terrorists on this memorial. The atrocity may have fallen from the public gaze, but for the families, the memories are still raw, the promises hollow. We have agreed that the two governments will work together and will do everything that is possible within their power to hunt down those that have been responsible for this outrage. It was a lovely child, but it was one of these wee cheeky children, you know, it was lovely. You know, when he was playing around their feet and all, when we were standing about. And I couldn't understand where that wee boy went. No. When you just wanted to have Owen back, you just wanted to see him, to hear him. And just a terrible longing for Owen. There's not a day passes by. It's an empty house, empty spaces, empty corners. It's not, it's reduced from being a, a home to house, you know. Esther was the eldest girl in our house and I'm the youngest. And she would have been a mother to me. You know, what I remember was when I was young, as having hair, I had very long hair, and Esther combing it out every Sunday, Saturday night for church on Sunday morning. And her being so gentle. Just little things. I'm determined that only good will prevail and no stone will be left unturned until we bring these people to justice. In fact, some of those stones were left unturned because what lay under them was secret intelligence, which somebody thought should never see the light of day. But tonight, we're going to lift them because what they reveal raises disturbing questions about whether the bombers could have been caught, even whether they could have been stopped in the first place. Omer wasn't a one-off. It was the culmination of a bombing campaign that had been building for months. A small group of dissident Republicans had broken from the IRA. They wanted to destroy the fledgling peace process. But the intelligence gathering arm of the Northern Irish Police, the Special Branch, had identified some of the main players by listening to their phones. 
the branch had set up a vast telephone interception operation. The problem was most of the bombers live south of the border in the Irish Republic. The branch has no capacity to intercept it in, in, in the sense that... It in, is the, in the Republic? In the Republic. It, it, you know, our, our jurisdiction stops at the border. The special branch asked for help from GCHQ, the government's powerful listening station at Cheltenham. I <laughs> would say they had the capacity to monitor in the Republic whether or not they would be prepared to sort of accept and admit to that. I'm quite certain that if conversations that were south of the border happened, then they would be monitored. Some time before Omar, the branch had passed on to GCHQ what they called a nugget, a phone number that was being used by the bombers. When they targeted the town of Banbridge, we're told GCHQ were recorded. As the car bomb was being parked, there was a coded exchange between the bombs. Bricks are in the wall. The bricks are in the wall. The caller also mentioned the number of bricks. Code for minutes left to detonation. The bombers then tried to phone a warning to a Belfast daily paper, the Irish News. Being a daily, and this being Saturday, the switchboard was closed. So the bombers' warning call went unanswered. They began to panic and had to resort to the 999 system. Emergency with service. There's a bomb in Glanbridge. This is Marjorie Cook. IRA. Marjorie. Cook. Cook. OK. The police barely had time to clear the streets. Thirty-eight people were injured. A massacre had been narrowly averted. Two weeks later to the day, the bombers and the target phone were on the move again. Well-informed sources have told us that GCHQ were recording conversations made to and from at least one mobile on the day of the OMA bombing. The first question is, was this monitoring by GCHQ being done live by people listening in real time? We've been told categorically by special branch sources that live monitoring had been requested. The day before Omer, the police had been warned of another attack from the Republic which the special branch believed would be a car bomb. The branch were expecting live monitoring because they hoped GCHQ could pinpoint the location of the target mobile. If they could, it would trigger a pre-arranged plan to stop the bombers. We don't know whether this monitoring was live, do we? Mm. No, but um, we're, I think it's a reasonable assumption that if the telephone number was provided mm -hmm. uh, and there was a surveillance uh, unit stood by to react to it, that the expectation of Special Branch, and mm -hmm. I think they have, made it quite clear was that they, they were using that, I would have expected to use that number as a trigger and lifetime would have been the optimum way of using the number. Yeah. Phone billing yeah. records show that at 12.41 the bombers began to use their mobiles in the Irish Republic. This contact lasted just 14 seconds, the first of nine coded exchanges between the two phones. Here was the classic configuration of a bomb run. Two cars, two mobile phones keeping them in contact. First the scout car, going ahead to check the road was clear of security forces. The second, the bomb car containing the bomb itself. 500 pounds of homemade explosives in the boot. The question was, could GCHQ spot this as a bomb run? For someone trying to intercept a mobile, it's not just a question of putting on headphones, you've actually got to break the signal, you've got to decrypt it. Oh yes, you need sophisticated equipment to do the number crunching, so to speak, to unravel the information that's inside the radio wave. It's very, very fast, very highly sophisticated. 
to eavesdrop on a mobile, GCHQ needs the phone's electronic signature, so it helps to have the assistance of the mobile phone operators. But in this case that seems unlikely, because the mobiles were registered to a foreign mobile network in the Irish Republic. When a mobile roams across the border into Northern Ireland, GCHQ can easily crack this electronic signature because British mobile companies are required to help them. The signature of the mobile in the scout car had been cracked because it had been across the border before. It had coordinated the previous bombing in Banbridge. So if GCHQ were listening live on the day of Omer, how much sense would they have made of what they heard? You would never get the use of the word bombing or anything else. They would have couched it in a parlance that uh, would have been maybe connected with the construction industry or with the taxi trade. So that anybody that was listening in would have difficulty just determining was this a genuine order for goods or services or was it some coded signal. At 12.50, half an hour before the mobiles crossed the border, came a clue that a bomb run was underway. The mobile in the scout car received a call from a phone box. That call came from this public telephone box at Barney's filling station. The Irish Republic is literally about 100 yards down the road. We're told that this phone box was also being bugged. The voice should have been familiar because we're also told it had been recorded three weeks earlier during a mortar attack on Nure police station. It was assessed as belonging to this man, Liam Campbell, so-called officer commanding those Republican dissidents who called themselves the real IRA. It wasn't just the voice that might have rung alarm bells, it was also who the real IRA leader was calling, because with each call, a carbon copy of what had happened two weeks earlier during the Banbridge bombing was unfolding. Campbell was calling the Irish News to check if their switchboard was open. As with Banbridge, it was closed. Once again, this was a Saturday. Phone logs show the next call was to the Samaritans to check if their switchboard was operating. It was. It was then that Campbell phoned the scout car, presumably to tell them all was well. Then, at around 1.30, another clue. We understand the words. We're crossing the line. Were picked up from one of the cars. When, according to the phone logs, they were crossing the border at Ochnacloy. If GCHQ was monitoring live, from now on the picture of a bomb run in progress should have begun to materialise. Both mobiles had handed over to the British-owned mobile company Vodafone, to which GCHQ would have had access. In 1998, was it possible to track a phone from mast to mast, I mean plot its track? Yes. It's a simple answer. Yes. But I mean, you know, quickly on a screen? Oh yes. You can follow that mobile telephone until it switches off. Uh, how accurately? I mean, how close to the mast, gen generally speaking? Well, that depends how the masts are laid out upon the landscape. Mm. It could be a, a mile, two miles, it can be down to a couple of hundred metres. So, instead of just one mobile inching north on a screen, if monitoring had been live, GCHQ would now be seeing two cars, just like a bomb run, heading towards Omer. There are a very limited number of access routes to Omer town. And if they came to the view that that was where a device was being taken, it would seem to me that they could have sent an immediate alert through to headquarters and to Omer, and that in Omer there could have been roadblocks set up, simple things. Um, and roadblocks in the past have had the effect of deterring people who would have planted bombs. They've seen this and they just abandoned the bombs by the roadside. But it was too late for roadblocks. At around 2.10, the bomb car arrived in Omer. They were still talking on their mobiles. 
in code. It's a very difficult task just to pick the issue out uh, that you're listening for, unless you've been giving some advanced, uh, as it were, information that this is the phrases and things that you should listen for. Now, that would be a golden nugget if you got that sort of intelligence in advance. GCHQ did have a golden nugget. Around 20 past two, they once again recorded the very same phrase they'd picked up two weeks ago to the day, just before the near massacre at Banbridge. Bricks are in the wall. If GCHQ were monitoring live, they should by now have been in little doubt about what was going to happen. The bomb was armed. The clock was ticking. Around 40 minutes, the detonation. A warning of a bomb near the courthouse was telephoned to the Samaritans. Roger, will you get 7 1 and go short of the courthouse and take a wander up, checking for cars that seem to be heavily laden down? It's supposed to be 500 pounds. These women were captured on CCTV shopping for shoes, oblivious to the car bomb just a few yards away. It's been so long, other ones say, you know, ten years, hasn't it flown in, it hasn't flown in. Because every morning you wake up, it's, you have an empty bed, you know, except me in it, you know. Well, uh, listen to so many promises from day one uh, about what's going to be done. And there will be no stone unturned. Mm. It seemed to me a lot of stones hasn't been unturned. And um, it's still got no better. Unless the government makes an exception to its rule, never to confirm or deny whether an interception has taken place, the Omer families may never know whether the bombing could have been stopped. But one thing does seem pretty clear. If there were voice recordings, these would have helped the detectives identify some of the bombers in order to make early arrests. A bomb has exploded in the center of Oma and there are reports that a number of people have been killed and many seriously injured. Eyewitnesses have spoken... Hungry though the detectives were for leads, they were told nothing about intercepts, phone numbers or voice recordings. Nothing, for example, about the fact that 26 minutes after the bomb exploded, a call from the scout car mobile was made to an accountant who immediately recognized his client's voice as that of this man, Seamus Daly, who we filmed secretly in 2000 at his farmhouse. There was further corroboration at 5.23 when Daly phoned his home. We've been told there were five telephone numbers in all, associated with names that included the first name, Seamus. None of this reached the detectives. Why ever not? If the police had been through the doors of the Daly farmhouse soon enough, who knows what they would have found. Even the day after the bombing, Daly still had possession of two of the mobiles that GCHQ had been monitoring. You're still in that golden hours period where if we had been able to get, uh, as it were, arrests made at that point in time, telephone numbers that they might have, uh, messages that they might have had were, you know, were the information that was telephoned in, forensic evidence in terms of clothing that were being worn, that could have been linked perhaps to vehicles used. That would have been, in a sense, manna from heaven as regards um, CID. The CID's job was to catch the bombers. The special branch's job was to pass on intelligence that might help them do that. The question is, how much of GCHQ's intelligence found its way to the detectives and when? The blunt truth is that none of the stories match up. 
about who got what and when. One source says the branch got the intercepts within six hours of the bombing. They categorically deny that. Five to six hours? Mm. No. My understanding is from uh, my special branch colleagues that it was into the middle of the next week. Uh, the bombing having happened on a Saturday. I think it was either the late Tuesday or Wednesday before the first, as it were, uh, information was passed to Special Branch. So what happened to it? The regional head of SB, uh, I understood, asked the question, you know, what happened? Why am I only getting this now? Uh, to which the comment I understood was uh, made to him, we missed it. And what did that mean? Well, I can only go on his interpretation of it was that either the conversation was so short or whoever was monitoring at that particular moment in time missed the conversation in its entirety and that uh, it may have been some period afterwards in listening to tapes or reading transcripts that they actually picked up on. If the Special Branch are complaining about GCHQ, then the CID make a similar complaint about the Special Branch. The detectives were pleading for intelligence. But their log records nothing until three and a half weeks after the bomb exploded. The Special Branch say the log is incomplete. They insist they brief the detectives immediately. What is clear is that the detectives didn't get everything. The branch say that's because GCHQ wouldn't allow the detectives to know there had been intercepts. So, although the detectives got some names, the intelligence was so heavily sanitized, the names were of limited use. The CID did make some arrests, but because they had nothing on which to build a case, all the suspects were released. The detectives weren't even told the bombers had used mobiles. That was left to them to work out for themselves. For months, they trawled through phone records, 6.4 million of them. I mean, we were never handed a list of numbers and names and told, look, those are the names, those are the numbers, that's who you need to concentrate on. It was always left that, look, go and find them. Finally, nine months after the bombing, the detectives identified 22 phones active in five bombings. But without GCHQ's evidence of voices, they couldn't prove who'd used them. The trail began to go cold. The inquiry lost momentum. What did the intelligence services do to help regain it? As the detail of that atrocity was breaking, you can imagine the leadership of the organization, uh, the panic in a sense that they must have been in, the membership themselves, who got it wrong, the blame game would have been going. Uh, there might have been discussions, well, who's the weak link in the chain here, who, if they are arrested, is likely to break. And yet we've been told Special Branch received just one feed of intelligence from GCHQ, the information they say they got on the Tuesday after the bombing. And after that, absolutely nothing. That could be because, um, theoretically, GCHQ weren't listening for it. That's a possibility. But not one you take seriously. Not one I take seriously. The only people able to resolve this discrepancy are the government, and their official position is no comment. It's a bizarre position, isn't it? The law says intercept evidence can't be used in court, and yet there's no law that says it can't be shared with ordinary police officers. So why wasn't the GCHQ material shared with the detectives? We don't know. Maybe they feared their secret methods and the fact that they'd been eavesdropping in the Irish Republic might leak out. Whatever the reason, the intelligence services decided on total secrecy. What? is intelligence for if it isn't to help solve an atrocity of this scale? I mean, there are 29 people dead. 
That is a question that has occupied my mind, uh, uh, of, of certainly of recent date as well, uh, as to what is the threshold whereby, as it were, the interests of national security give way to the interests of making terrorists amenable before the courts for the singular most uh, important atrocity that took place. What about all that panicky post-bombing chatter that the special branch assumed GCHQ was tasked to capture, but which the branch say they never got hide nor hair of? I think that immediately the names had been passed over, that a conscious decision must have been made somewhere, that that's it. We have given them, as it were, an investigative start, but we can't expose our hand any further, otherwise it raises the specter of a demand coming for an intelligence product to be used in an evidential format, and that is a, a bridge too far. And what's your reaction to that? Well, one of amazement and, and, and dismay, immense dismay, that all the promises that Prime Minister made, the Chief Constable made, Secretary of State made, were all basically, uh, well, run hollow. Today, the key culprits, those whose voices still presumably languish somewhere in the intelligence services, continue to enjoy their freedom. Here's Seamus Daly, the man the police believe organized the bombing. He's got a new house and is in the scrap metal business. The OMA bomb inquiry has been severely criticised over the years in several reports. The first phase of the inquiry has been portrayed as sometimes muddled, a bit slapdash. There were big staff reductions and forensic evidence wasn't always properly looked after. But what our research suggests is that the detectives were never given the evidential bullets to fire in the first place. One officer said this to me, he said, we've been starved of essential intelligence. Do you agree with that? I think that very succinctly wraps up what was the situation that was presented to our CID officers, both north and south. If we never meet again, the side of heaven I will meet you on that beautiful shore. Tomorrow, the family's battle resumes at the High Court in Belfast as they try to gain official access to the intelligence material that John and his team discovered. And there's a sting in the tail here because John has also seen minutes of a meeting in 1999 at which the then head of MI5 referred to an unsuccessful two-year police security service job where use of intercept material may have resulted in a prosecution, but where the suspects later went on to carry out a major terrorist act. He said this might conceivably have been avoided if the intercept material could have been used. Now, did that refer to OMA? If not, which major terrorist act was it which might conceivably have been avoided? Next week, the intelligence the state gathers on you.